Kia ora katoa. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, after a very quiet week on the COVID response front, and because everyone's currently talking about the weather, uh, I'm particularly pleased to report today that the first 360 doses of the Pfizer vaccine were delivered to the Chatham Islands at 7.30pm yesterday in somewhat stormy weather conditions. Uh, the Chatham Islands is home to one of New Zealand's most isolated communities. If COVID-19 was to make it there, the community could be severely compromised, uh, placing significant pressure on the Canterbury DHB. They've identified the islands as a priority group, uh, and uh, people can expect to get their vaccinations on the Chatham Islands over the next few weeks. Around 560 uh, residents on the, Chatham, uh, on the Chatham and Pitt Islands uh, will be eligible to get to their first doses of the vaccine. They'll be storing them very carefully as they get their campaign underway over there. As of midnight last night, we have delivered 1,149,608 doses of the vaccine across New Zealand. That's an increase of more than 130,000 doses on last week. Uh, within that, just over 705,000 New Zealanders have now received their first dose, uh, and more than 444,000 have received their second dose, meaning they are fully vaccinated. Uh, of those, 206,406 are in Group 3, uh, or have had their first dose from Group 3, uh, and 91,477 uh, in Group 3 have had their second dose. Of the information going up on the Ministry of Health website right about now, uh, we've added a bit of additional information to the dashboard this week. You'll see there's a bar chart indicating vaccinations by group, uh, by week, and a table that shows cumulative vaccinations for each of our groups. Overall, we continue to track ahead of plan. It's about 8% ahead of plan. Uh, mindful that we have some tight delivery schedules that we're working for and we're managing supply uh, very closely. Uh, we've been clear uh, for some time now that we could e enter a period of tight supply relative to demand uh, through June and early July. That's very much the position that we are in at the moment, as I outlined uh, yesterday. But just to give you a little bit more detail on that, uh, ahead of the large deliveries that we expect to uh, receive from mid-July onwards, we're expecting a million doses to be delivered across uh, July. We are finally calibrating, uh, you know, calibrating the supply across our 20 district health boards. Uh, by the time our weekly delivery of Pfizer arrives next week, uh, we'll have less than a day's worth of vaccine left in our freezers. That is a deliberate decision. We've taken the decision that we would rather have vaccines in people's arms than waiting in fridges. Transport management processes are now much, much more streamlined than they were in the beginning, uh, meaning that DH we get underway dispatching uh, vaccines to, delivery to DHBs within a few hours. Uh, so vials uh, can land by international air freight in the early hours of the morning and be on the road uh, by mid-morning. Stock levels at each DHB are being monitored very closely. Uh, and we're making sure that the deliveries that we give them uh, in this, uh, over this next few days uh, is very closely aligned to their bookings so that the stock is getting to the right places uh, and to match that demand. In terms of Group 3, uh, district health boards are continuing to contact everybody in Group 3 to let them know that they will be receiving an invitation by the end of July. Uh, by the 23rd of July, everybody who is enrolled with a GP should have received an invitation to book their vaccine. Uh, group 3 vaccinations do continue to increase. In terms of the booking system, district health boards are in the final stages of transferring their existing booking data into the online system, Book My Vaccine. Uh, book My Vaccine will be used to book appointments when our Group 4 rollout begins, uh, so therefore it will be available to the wider public to see uh, from the end of July, around the 28th of July. I understand some of the people in the room here saw a demonstration of that uh, last Friday. It is a huge and complex system. Those going online today looking for it won't see it. It's only visible to those who are being invited at this point. 
but to successfully migrate all of the information into the system, uh, the IT teams uh, have been working well into the night, overnight in some cases. That work is unseen. Uh, many people won't even know that it happens, uh, but I do want to acknowledge those teams who are working incredibly hard and send a shout out to them uh, to, thank you, to thank them for the work that they've been doing. We have had uh, questions in the last few days on uh, other vaccine candidates uh, and the Janssen vaccine in particular. It is the next uh, likely vaccine to be approved in New Zealand. The Medicines Assessment Advisory Committee met earlier this month to discuss their application, Janssen's application uh, for their COVID-19 vaccine and they're in the final stages of making a decision uh, on whether to grant provisional approval for the Janssen vaccine to be used in New Zealand. Uh, and we should be able to provide a more comprehensive update on that next week. Uh, they're in the final stages of that uh, decision-making process. So in closing, uh, we started today by focusing on our vaccine numbers. <clears throat> but before I hand over to the Director-General for his update, I do want to acknowledge a couple of other significant things. Uh, the ongoing intensity required around our COVID-19 responses reflected in the 10,097 tests reported today. So a big thank you to those involved in testing across the country and also a big thank you to those uh, who have been coming forward to get tested. That's worth remembering that we have processed 2,288,000 tests so far during this pandemic, having been the recipient of some of those tests, uh, I do want to acknowledge particularly those uh, who are being very frequently tested for COVID-19. I also want to acknowledge that we're about to hit uh, another significant milestone in our managed isolation facilities. 150,000 New Zealanders uh, will have uh, passed through our managed isolation facilities in the next few, within the next few days since the pandemic began, uh, and we've seen very few incidents uh, of COVID-19 passing out into the community. It has been an incredibly successful system uh, and that is the result of the hard work and dedication of those who are walk, working at our border to make sure that where COVID-19 does land in New Zealand, it stays at the border and doesn't make it out into the community. So to all those frontline workers, wherever they are, whether they're at the border or in our MIQ, uh, I think the entire country owes them a great big thank you for their work. I now hand over to the Director General. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So, uh, pleased to report today, as the Minister's mentioned, no community cases, and we have one new case of COVID-19 and a recent returnee in our managed isolation facility. All our other numbers will be reported through today's statement from the Ministry. With regards to the situation in Australia, members of the Ministry's public health team are continuing to closely monitor the situation there. Currently, more than 12 million Australians, close to half the population, are covered by lockdown-type restrictions there. And just to summarise uh, what the situation is regarding quarantine-free travel and what is intended to happen over coming days, currently quarantine-free travel flights from all of Australia are paused until Sunday the 4th of July at 11.59pm. After that time, quarantine-free travel flights from Melbourne, Canberra, Adelaide and Hobart will resume unless there are developments in the interim that change the risk profile for any of those places. And all passengers travelling from those places must present evidence of a negative pre-departure test taken within 72 hours of boarding, and that test must be a PCR test. The quarantine-free travel pause remains in place for New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and Northern Territories until 11.59pm Tuesday the 6th of July and a review of the pause will occur on Monday the 5th of July and officials are currently looking at options, as the Minister mentioned yesterday, to help return people home to New Zealand from pause-affected states or territories if the pause is extended there beyond 11.59 on Tuesday the 6th. A reminder, though, to anyone, wherever they are in Australia, that if you were at a location of interest, that at the time specified, you are not able to travel to New Zealand from anywhere in Australia for 14 days after that exposure event. Regarding pre-departure testing, travellers wanting to think about future travel back from Australia can look on the Unite Against COVID website to just get clarity around 
uh, what is required, and uh, local health officials wherever you are in Australia will have information on where you can be tested. That testing is done privately, and the cost is generally between $120 and $180 per test. On border worker vaccinations, just a quick update on a vaccination among that workforce, particularly those who don't work in managed isolation facilities. The latter group, of course, is required to be fully vaccinated. There are more than 200 businesses operating at a range of borders around the country, both airports and ports. This includes everyone from airport shop workers to truck drivers who are attending ports. You can appreciate also there is turnover of staff and that many of these people are only uh, at these sites fleetingly as part of their work. The latest figures we have show that 83% of workers recorded as active in the border worker testing register have received their second dose of the vaccine, so they are considered fully vaccinated, while another 3% have received at least their first dose. The remaining 14% have either not yet been vaccinated, are exempt, or uh, had not been able to be matched to their vaccination record. That's a small number. But only some of these workers, of course, currently fall under the current vaccine order that requires them to be vaccinated. However, as the Minister mentioned yesterday, there has been work on the next iteration of that border order, and it will be coming shortly. It sh will extend the mandatory requirement for vaccination to a much bigger group of people working at the border. The Ministry, right from the start, has worked closely with DHBs and our colleagues across government and in the private sector uh, around that vaccine rollout to this group of workers. Uh, that's included providing information in multiple languages, holding face-to-face -face sessions with workers where they have had the opportunity to ask questions of health experts, and I myself have done some of those over Zoom. I'm confident that these workers have access to good information, and with between 100 and 50 and 200 vaccination sites open most days around the Motu. They have, and they have had and continue to have good access to vaccination. Thank you, Minister. Jessica. You use the language managing supply and tight supply, but we're running out of vaccines. Is that acceptable? Oh, look, we're getting vaccines in as fast as we can. Um, so we were very clear back in uh, January when we made the decision to switch to a Pfizer campaign, uh, rather than using multiple different vaccines at that time, that that would mean we, we would be waiting until the second half of the year to get the bulk of our vaccine deliveries in. Um, Pfizer have been very good to work with in terms of when they when they indicate that they're going to deliver a, a quantity at a given time, they, they, de they meet that delivery schedule, um, and so we're really appreciative of that. But we did make that decision um, to uh, to try and calibrate our vaccine supplies in the first half of the year so that we weren't leaving much left in the freezer uh, while we uh, stood prepared for the big, the big doses to arrive. Why not just say we're running out of vaccines? We just have to prepare for that. Well, we know we've got more vaccines coming. Well, yeah. So, uh, well, well, of course, but I mean, that's always going to be the case. That the goal is not to have a whole lot sitting in the freezer for a prolonged period of time. It's to get it out uh, as quickly as we can as it gets into the country. Well, I'll let you finish that, Jessica. Uh, what's the hold up with the Look, it's still just going through the, the final stages of the MedSafe approval process. Uh, so um, uh, often with the approvals process, there's uh, discussion between the, the company uh, and MedSafe just around any wording that goes, you know, it's a little the dotting the I's, crossing the T's part of the, the process. Uh, so that's the part of the process, I believe, that they are in at the moment. New research, well, well, it, new research out today shows we need about 97% of all New Zealanders, including children, to be vaccinated with Pfizer to protect against the Delta variant. Is herd immunity effectively impossible for New Zealand? Look, I've always said, and this is a, it's a useful contribution to the discussion, uh, and it is a model, it is, uh, and so we should see that as a model, but I've always said really clearly, um, I'm not going to settle for any target less than everybody being offered the chance to get, to get the vaccine, uh, and everybody taking up the chance to be the vaccine, unless there's a really good reason not to, such as a medical reason not to. Uh, it is a safe vaccine, uh, it is the way we can all keep each other safe, uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to set a target that's anything below saying everyone should get it. But Minister, it's, it's I just wonder if I could make a couple of supplementary comments uh, that uh, speak to the question you've asked. First of all, the research, which is, is helpful, the modelling is helpful, what it does show is that uh, to achieve uh, immunity and protect New Zealanders, 
just with the vaccine would require a very high level of coverage. However, there is considerable benefit even at lower rates of uh, vaccination coverage, except that we have to have quite strong public health measures in place. The higher our vaccination rates, the less those additional measures have to be in place and the less likely we are to have to use uh, lockdown type situations to manage outbreaks. The second comment I would make is that there is uh, good emerging evidence that the Pfizer vaccine provides a high level of protection against the Delta variant, which is encouraging. And the third comment is, and this uh, uh, carries on from the comment I've just made, is that if you look in the United Kingdom, where they have got quite high uh, rates of vaccination, full vaccination, and still quite high rates of infection, uh, so the equivalent in New Zealand, or, or quite high numbers of infection, the equivalent in New Zealand of over 1,000 cases a day, virtually all the people being admitted to hospital or dying from COVID are unvaccinated. Uh, and, by, and virtually all the infections there now are Delta variant. So this shows the um, effectiveness of vaccination in protecting individuals and of helping prevent that wider population um, morbidity and mortality and impact on our health system. So realistically, if we can't achieve, achieve herd immunity, do we just have to have these controls in New Zealand indefinitely? Look, I think we've always said that there's not going to be some magical moment where we where all of the controls just suddenly disappear. Uh, our reopening to the world is likely to be a progressive exercise. Um, in terms of the higher levels of vaccination, yes, it will have an impact on the types of control measures that we use where we where we see outbreaks in the community. Um, but there's still a lot of water to flow under the bridge yet. Uh, and of course, international vaccination rates play a really important role here in New Zealand as well. Uh, we've, I've, I've used the phrase when nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Actually, the virus continues to spread around the rest of the world. And that's still a concern for us here in New Zealand. It still increases the risk to us here in New Zealand. Yeah, it's even possible that we could get to 97% vaccination rates. Well, I think as the Director General has um, has commented on, uh, focusing only on herd immunity at this point isn't particularly helpful. There's a lot of uh, aspects of this that we need to focus on, and the more New Zealanders th who get vaccinated, uh, the better we are going to be across a whole range of different measures. Do you have any new estimates for the actual work size as well? Because the estimates we Oh, you mean the numbers of people with doses in each group? Uh, yes, I do. I Minister just... has probably got those numbers, yes. but as he said, we're actually showing now uh, a new graph on the website that shows the number of vaccines given each week by group. Uh, so we will be making that available uh, with a new um, a graph. And of course, as we move into the new, as the new deliveries arrive to assure our supply and the, the numbers go up each week, you will see um, the, the number of Group 3 people being vaccinated increasing considerably week on week, and then Group 4 as that comes on, online too. So just quickly running through those in Group 1, 55,648 first dose, 50,917 second dose. Group 2, 389,721 first dose, 282,167 second dose. Uh, group 3, 206,406 first dose and 91,477 second dose. Group 4, 53,287 first dose uh, and 19,985 second dose. Are you confident in Group 2, most people in Group 2 uh, haven't had a dose yet or fully vaccinated, but they've been offered the vaccine, but they haven't had a chance to take up yet? Uh, yes, uh, they will have been, um, and obviously it's voluntary for Group 2, but we'd certainly encourage them to uh, to take up the ability to be vaccinated early. Would you consider at all using Yartsin? Can you roll out using this part of the mass vaccination rollout? Obviously there's a lot of advantages to speed, and we're still expecting not to get the full shipment of Pfizer until October, uh, and then you know, that has to be rolled out. Yartsin, we've got this big order and pay money for it. We'd say we're probably going to approve it is basically the understanding. A lot of people will probably be fine with a slightly lower protection, slightly higher rate of blood clots from nuts in. Can, could, you, could you consider using it as, as part of the vaccine rollout, people who want it? Oh, look, we're, we're continuing to go through the approvals process with it so that we have it there as an option. Um, I wouldn't rule it in or out, though. But at the moment, at Plan A is still to offer everybody the chance to get the, the Pfizer vaccine by the end of the year. Do you mean people who actually need it because they're allergic to something with the Pfizer vaccine? Or are you actually thinking 
everyone could, you know, someone could call up next month and say, I want the arts and rugby right now, even if they're 25 and healthy. Oh, certainly, I think for a small group of people, it may well be an option if they can't have the Pfizer vaccine. But in terms of making it available, uh, we're not working on a choice-based campaign here. We are working on a Pfizer-based campaign. That's our intention to continue down that road. And actually, most other countries who are using multiple different vaccines don't provide people with a choice. They basically uh, get told which vaccine they're going to have. And does that mean that the Janssen vaccine will sit in storage in the, in the eventuality that we need it? Uh, certainly, um, delivery schedules have not been confirmed with them yet. So there's one, you know, there's two, two sta or there's multiple stages to this process. Approval is one big part of the the, the stage. Uh, deliver uh, decision to use and in the conditions in which we would use it is another stage. And then, of course, delivery, confirming a delivery schedule is another. So uh, the, the the approvals process is just one of those. But I'm yes, just two comments to follow up what the minister said. First of all, our um, our COVID vaccination uh, technical advisory group has already looked at the circumstances and their advice to myself and through to um, Cabinet about when the Janssen vaccine might be used. And as the Minister said, there may be some people who, for whatever reason, can't receive the Pfizer vaccine, uh, for whom it would, would be indicated. But their advice also, preliminary advice to me, is that uh, given we have the Pfizer vaccine, which is a very uh, a highly effective vaccine and has got a very good safety profile and showing very good effectiveness against the new variants, their advice would be to maintain our, our Pfizer-based program. The Janssen vaccine can be stored uh, in the freezers for up to two years. And of course, then um, there is the option either of using it here, should it be indicated, for example, if there was a, a very big disruption to the supply of um, Pfizer, uh, or indeed, it could then become it could then be considered for donation to other countries, and that would be a separate decision, obviously, for Cabinet. And the requirement for mandatory vaccination among board workers, who is that going to be extended to cover, and what proportion of the workforce will that then be? Uh, look, it will be a more significant part of the workforce than it is now. Um, we've made, I've made some decisions about that. Uh, we're still in the process of working through all of the finer details of that. We're not far from being able to share that information, though. So I, I just can't share that today. Yes. Your statements that, that we will run to a point where we have about one day's mm. doses left, is that based on us returning to that 100% of plan and not being at 107? That's right. So that And, and DHBs... Uh, you'll see that whilst they, they've still, uh, the overall average is still maintained ahead of plan, they have been getting back closer to plan. Some of them, are, there's still a little bit of over in there, in the, in the system. Um, but uh, look, I, I think we're, it's finally balanced, uh, it would be fair to say. So, so we're still at 107% above plan, same as last week, down from the week before, because of the nurses' strike. Um, do you really think we're going to get back down to 100 in two weeks' time? Can I comment, the Minister? Yeah. Um, the reason we will, even at the end of uh, our current supply and before that um, next big shipment comes, we, we will stay above 100% and probably land at around 106 and 107% is because uh, in many places the vaccinators have been able to get the seven doses out of the six dose, vi dose vials and the plans were based, 100% of plan was based on six doses per vial. So we will maintain that in a sense, delivering ahead of what the plan was right through to uh, to next week when the when the new um, uh, drop uh, arrives. So ben. Can I jump on that? So, so I, I think you said um, on Monday that you had less than 30,000 um, doses left and the supply was around 50,000 that you received this week. So, so am I right in thinking that you will only administer around 80,000 doses this week? No, because that, that was what we hold. Um, the people who are doing the vaccinations hold vaccines as well. So there's already vaccines out there in distribution, bearing in mind now that there's a much longer shelf life. So when we started this, we were working on the basis that we had to keep pumping it out for, for no more than five days. So um, now they can be stored for longer. So there is more vaccine out there sitting in freezers around the country, um, which, which is why the combination of that, I don't have that exact figure, but the combination of that number plus what we've got in store is what's going to get us through to uh, next Tuesday. Do you expect the similar amount of vaccines to be administered this week as last week, so around 140,000? Yes, it might, yes. And, and there's obviously that crunch point that arrives on Tuesday, um, but when are we out of the woods, when do we have that very big, when's that very first very big 
expecting around, give or take, 150,000 to arrive uh, next week. Uh, so that's obviously more than we have been doing on a weekly basis at this point. So that helps to start us, build up a little bit more of a buffer there. Uh, and then uh, the following week, hopefully, we'll be able to build up a little bit more of a buffer again. Uh, and then from mid-month mid onwards, we start getting bigger bigger deliveries, which will mean that we then start to ramp up again. Well, as I've indicated, we're going to get a million doses over over the July, uh, over the month of July. Well, Jessica, I'll we'll come break, back to you. Can we get a breakdown of the um, Māori vaccination rates, and how concerned so it sits at about 10% overall uh, at the moment. I think 10% of the first doses have gone to Māori and about 9% uh, second doses. So that is below the population um, for Māori proportionately. I think if you look across particularly Group 2, which is our biggest, one of our biggest, well, it is our biggest group so far, um, our health workforce, for example, we know, unfortunately, Māori are disproportionately underrepresented in our health workforce. That's something that I think as a country we need to focus on. We need to, to, to deal with that. That's not something vaccination is going to deal with. Uh, but we do need to see those numbers increasing for Māori, uh, and that will certainly be a, a focus uh, as we get into groups three and four. So that's a drop in the percentage rate. How concerned are you about that? Um, look, I think um, it does highlight that as we get into groups three and four, we're going to need to really focus there on our equity challenges, making sure that for Māori uh, particularly, uh, but also for Pacific communities uh, and for lower socioeconomic areas, that we're making sure we're getting good population coverage there and in line with their share of the population, if you like. Um, I'm looking at the DHB by DHB numbers. So um, if you look at Northland, Tairawhiti, Auckland, high concentrations of Māori, they're doing slightly better, which is reassuring. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's any room for complacency. We, we, we have to do better in that, in that regard. On extending, um, to clarify, on extending the mandatory vaccination border order, so it could be that sort of all frontline border, border workers, whether they're in public or private, hiring, will have to get vaccinated. Uh, look, we'll have more detail on that soon, but certainly the the major, vast majority of people who need to be tested because they're you know at, at more risk are, are likely to end up needing to be vaccinated. And have you considered the potential negative knock-on effects of that of people moving out of that and sort of there potentially being skills shortages because of people not wanting to get vaccinated, so then leaving? Absolutely, and that's one of the things that we worked through with industry. What we have found. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to name and shame any particular you know, groups here, uh, so I'll speak in generalisations, but we found that where we've discovered pockets of hesitancy amongst that workforce, uh, and we've worked more intensively with those workers to uh, make sure they're getting good impartial information, so it's often been sitting them down with a medical professional for... 10, 15 minutes to actually talk through the ins and outs of it, what their re reservations may be, we generally found that sort of 90 plus percent of them then say, oh, well, let's get on with it and let's have this vaccine. So, yeah. Have you, have you, sorry, have you considered um, sort of extending the groups eligible? So, for example, at the ports, sort of make more people eligible at the ports, so people who they share their lunchroom breaks with, they have more of their peers who are vaccinated to sort of... People. We'll get more options in that space as we move move into broader groups of the population being vaccinated. Yeah. The data on genomic testing on, on recent cases detected at the border, and, what, and how many of those cases have had the Delta variant? I don't have the latest tally, but... We, we do have those data, and we get a report every week from ESR, so I'm happy to provide that, um, that information. Is it widely the Delta variant? Uh, that's uh, off the top of my head, no, but we can give the proportions of which variants we're finding at the border. That's just because that, that kind of reflects the, the, the new model from PPM that Amelia was talking about earlier. The, the PM had started the year talking about the need to, to transition from uh, the border to a, a kind of personal armour around each other, uh, and that language was really based off of the sort of original COVID. Um, does the, the prevalence of the Delta variant overseas make that kind of I guess, language impossible going forward? I'm not really sure what your question was there. Sorry? Um, well, I guess, has the Delta variant changed your plans? No. I mean, ultimately, our goal is still to get as, um, as many people vaccinated as possible. It is still to uh, keep border protections in place to make sure that we're not allowing COVID-19 any quarter uh, in New Zealand uh, and to work really quickly to stamp out uh, any incursions that may come up. That's still the broad plan, uh, and we're, we're still sticking to that. Now, Derek, I'm worried your uh, blood flow in your arm is uh, decreasing. So, uh, Do you have any update? You, a few weeks ago, you put out a call for the household uh, for border workers. 
from the numbers you said earlier, there seems to be at least 100,000 people in Group 1 now. That's obviously a lot more than was first anticipated, although I know we don't actually know what the denominator there is. We don't know what the denominator there is. No, I think... Um, and, and, uh, I think it, it, you can't add the first and second dose together. So that's it's 55,000 people overall who, who 55,600 people overall who have had uh, at least one dose. The second doses are generally have had a first dose as well. So uh, that, that's the total number at this point. So, yes. Like we know yeah. that uh, I think you said before, Dr. Bloomfield, that there's at least 27,000 border workers in the system who have been vaccinated, or, or mm. roughly thereabouts. So this would indicate that only about 27,000 households. As I've indicated before, some of those household members may have been vaccinated but may not count under Group 1, so they might have been recorded under Group 2 or 3. Uh, you know, if, you were, if, if, if a border worker is living with a nurse, for example, the nurse might be counted under, uh, under Group 2. So they're not, it's not perfect, in for perfect data. Uh, but I'll, I'll Just in the last week, for example, so it is uh, going up week on week. So in the last seven days, 386 people in that household um, group for, uh, so group 1B we call it, 386 had a first dose and 611 a second dose. So it's still increasing and that is people in that group who are, being ID who are identified as being household members of border workers. Well, Joe, Joe. To, to get vaccinated for that group, so I mean, is, is there anything else we can do there or is it just seem like this? We'll keep doing everything we're doing. I mean, it's providing really good information and access to the vaccine and as I say, between 150 and 200 sites are uh, open most days at the moment. Uh, through from mid July, that will scale up, and through July and August, be up to 800 sites um, around the country. So there will be lots of opportunities for those people and others to be vaccinated. Joe, um, just on the postcode lottery nature of the vaccinations, unsurprisingly, I'll use Taranaki as an example again. But um, the over 65s group, there's still no vaccinations happening there, and it's not just that DHB. There's quite a few. You talked some weeks ago about the fact that. You know, there were multiple reasons, resources, etc., and that it was for the DHB to, to do that. But is any pressure actually going on from a government or a Ministry of Health level, or as far as you're concerned, is it just a case of, well, if everyone gets vaccinated by the end of the year, it's fine? Um, look, there will be unders and overs between now and the end of the year, absolutely, and we want people to be vaccinated by the end of the year. But we do want people to be vaccinated broadly in line with the sequencing framework that we have set out. I accept that there'll be some unders and overs in that. So I just mentioned the Chatham Islands at the beginning, for example, doesn't make sense to send over just enough vaccines to do uh, uh, you know, a few hundred of them when actually it makes sense to do all of them at the same time. So uh, there will be some variation in that. Uh, in terms of those district health boards that are slower to start Group 3 or slower to get bigger numbers in Group 3, all have started Group 3. Um, we have been really clear with them that they need to let people know uh, by the end of July, or they need to let people know as soon as possible that they will get an invitation by the end of July to uh, have their opportunity to get into the vaccine programme. You said in the past that you were going to have some, I think they were called vaccine champions, um, and they were basically people that would be going out into the community and demonstrating that the vaccine was safe. Where is um, Cabinet or the government sitting now as to A, who those people will be, and B, when they'll be revealed? Well, look, you will have already seen examples of this, you know, of, of high-profile, you know, public personalities going and getting their vaccinations, whether it's the Governor-General, the uh, political leaders, um, per, you know, um, Kaumatua um, have been playing a lead role here, church ministers, um, some of our sports people. I, I saw the coverage of uh, Dame Valerie getting her uh, vaccination ahead of the Olympics and, sp and doing that live on camera, which I know only too well how that feels. Um, and so you will see more of that, and particularly as we get into those bigger population groups. What we've tried to do, though, is make sure that um, uh, we're arranging those photo opportunities, for want of a better term, broadly in line with when people fitting that description will be able to get their vaccination as well. So, sorry? Um, so for the Australian Traveller on the weekend, were there any issues with contact tracing Australian tourists in Wellington? And has Cabinet considered any additional measures for Australian tourists who are going to come to New Zealand once the pause opens, like a um, compulsory COVID tracing app on their phone? My, um, the, the feedback I've had uh, so far is that um, Australians coming to New Zealand do tend to be pretty active in their use of the QR code system, the COVID tracer app system. 
um, and the, the contact tracers haven't had any difficulty in, in that regard, uh, bearing in mind that uh, in, in this one case, or the, well, two really if you count the person's partner, uh, they were very diligent in keeping good records of where they've been and that definitely helped our contact tracing teams. So not looking at anything specific there, we are of course looking at that broader issue around how do we provide uh, more accurate information faster to our contact tracing teams. Uh, we'll have more on that, and that's particularly around the COVID tracer app, but we'll have more on that uh, in due course. But in the meantime, my message to all Kiwis is uh, it is one of the best things you can do to keep COVID out of the community is to keep good records of where you've been. So for our elderly community who uh, you know, don't want to use the, the QR code system, uh, if they're keeping some kind of record, we've got little booklets available where they can use those for as a record instead. Uh, please do that. It really does make a difference for our contact tracers. Oh, Just yeah. 2,600 contacts. There are still 83 that have been contact traced. Why is it taking so long to get to those 80 odd people? It, um, I think I did. Sorry, I didn't bring that breakdown with me today, but. Yeah. My understanding was that some of them are not, are not yet due. So uh, there's a small group, I think, uh, who are not yet due. There's actually very, very, quite a small number that are being chased because they have an overdue test. So um, I, I don't know whether the Director General has the, the daily breakdown. Mm -hmm. 83 that listed as chasing for contact tracing purposes? Yes, they're still, we're just uh, chasing to either match the test if they've had one or to just confirm that they have had a test. If not, we can, uh, we arrange for them to be tested. But we are up over now, over 96% of tests back, all negative. How concerning is it with those 83 people? Because that sounds like a lot. In the scheme of things, as we talked about yesterday, given we were, chase we were following up over 2,600 people, uh, not, not concerning because we haven't seen any other signals from those other results we've had. And these people will be... Uh, will be followed up and chased up. It, it's, it's, it's worth recalling here that we've cast the net far wider than we have for any other COVID-19 case we've ever dealt with. Uh, the Viral report, which set out the, you know, the, the gold standard for contact tracing, suggested that you might have sort of 20 to 30 contacts per case. Uh, we're talking about 2,600 for this one case. So the system has performed remarkably well in that environment. Ben, ben come back to you. Like well, we'll come back to Ben and then uh, Amelia. Yeah. Yeah, if we cast our minds back to the Papatoto High School, for example, it was the very people who didn't get traced who ended up having it, and that presented a whole slew of problems. So, like, how will we do we keep running into the instances where we can't get in contact with all of these people, and do we need to be setting up those mobile testing sites soon? I mean, if I take the first part of your question first, um, I think there was a difference in Papatoto in that we were dealing with spread of COVID-19. We were dealing with active cases. Here we were dealing with one person who's subsequently left. Uh, so there is a bit of a difference there. And in the context of, you know, two and a half thousand people traced and testing negative, that gives us some reassurance that the likelihood of those few remaining uh, people uh, being positive uh, is very low. Uh, in terms of that better contact information, though, that is a, an issue that we keep under review all of the time. Uh, we get good information at the border of people coming into the country. The very mere um, act of signing up for the COVID Tracer app and sharing your contact details uh, helps us enormously because it means our contact tracing teams have a current phone number for you and a current email address for you, for example. So just doing that one thing uh, is actually a really important uh, way of, of us being able to keep in touch with people. Um, using the QR code system, uh, monitoring for the, <clears throat> for the alert notifications when they come up as well, Please don't just swipe it off the screen and forget about it. If you're getting an alert notification, you're getting it for a reason. Uh, please take the action that the alert notification asks you to take. In your comments, you said that you, were, you had or you were about to land on 150,000 New Zealanders through MIQ. What's the data for international foreign, foreign um, nationalities going through MIQ? I, I don't have that with me, but I can certainly get you the, pop, the breakdown of where they've come from. Um, obviously... So I'm not sure what the... Well, you've given exemptions to go through MIQ to non-New Zealanders. Yes. So I'm wondering, what's the data? How many Australians have been through? How many Canadians have you been through? Yeah, you know, I'm happy to, I'm happy to give you a, get you a breakdown of the country of origin uh, of all of those 150, if that's what you're asking for. Yes. So it's not where they've come from, the nationalities. Oh, right, yeah, I, I see, yeah, yeah. But we can certainly do that. But it's yeah. like the post-code lottery I think Joe was just talking about. Obviously, there are areas of the country where are over 65, so it's really keen to get the vaccine and can't have it. That's pretty, that's pretty much uh, unfavorable. 
There's also areas that clearly people are calling the number up during Group 4 and they're getting vaccinated. 53,000 now in Group 4 have been vaccinated. Yeah. Obviously, some of them will be house on contact or something, or being good reasons. But that's, that's quite a high number, isn't it? 54,000 people is not a handful of people. If you look at that as a proportion of the million odd doses that are being delivered, it's still still reasonably small. Um, as I've indicated before, I, I think there are a variety of reasons for that. One is where DHBs have been doing community by community vaccination for small communities, where it just makes sense to do that. Uh, there'll be that will be a contributing factor. Uh, there may also be a contributing um, factor where you've done a there've there been a whole family, for example, um, who are who have been vaccinated together. Some of whom are in that higher risk category uh, and for convenience and for the purposes of getting them to have the vaccine, uh, the family members may have been done at the same time. And then of course there was that small group uh, of people who just got lucky uh, because when we were managing five day allocations at a time and, and doses were going to expire, um, we did say to teams, just vaccinate people if you've got vaccines that are about to expire. That's less of a problem now because of that longer shelf life that we've got out of the vaccine. Yeah. My message is please don't do that. Um, please, let's just work our way through the sequencing framework so that we're vaccinating those at the higher risk first, uh, and then we will work our way through. Once we get into group four, it becomes a demand management um, issue, uh, and we'll be working to manage to demand. But look, at this point, please just let those people, groups one, groups two particularly, but then also into group three, please let them get their vaccinations first. Uh, because those we've prioritised them for a reason. Um, Derek, like other countries are sort of rolling out faster than we are because they have more vaccines that they're using, and we've chosen to go with Pfizer. Uh, is our decision to go with Pfizer that affected the timeline for me take approval of any of the other ones that we had purchased agreements for? Uh, no, it hasn't, because Medsafe is uh, first of all is. Um, uh, the first point is Medsafe is reliant on the data being provided by the companies, uh, and so there's no, there's no sense that the companies, those companies have been on a go slow because we've chosen uh, Pfizer. Uh, the second comment here is that the deliveries from those other companies that produce the other vaccines, Janssen and AstraZeneca, were scheduled to come in from quarter three, for, uh, for, in my recollection anyway. The, the decision was made back in February when the offer came for the additional Pfizer vaccines that were over and above what we had pre-ordered, uh, which we're coming, to, we're coming to the end of those we had pre-ordered. In fact, we were able to bring some of the quarter three delivery forward into quarter two. I think about 100,000 of those doses were brought forward. We, we knew then that the balance of our vaccine would arrive in the second half of the year, and we, we, made that, we gave that advice and made that call because we felt a single um, vaccine program based on the Pfizer vaccine, which even then had a very good effect, effectiveness and safety profile, and that's borne out, um, that was the way to go, and we'd sort of stand by that because advice. We could not have gone any faster if we decided to go with more vaccines as well. Uh, the, the logistics around establishing the whole program around a sing, single vaccine was um, was much easier than than the logistics, and the training, and everything around a program that was based on more than one vaccine. That doesn't mean if there is a, an indication to use a second vaccine, we won't be able to do that. But a single vaccine-based program was definitely um, logistically more simple. I'm aware the bell, the bell is about to toll. So last question up the back. Oh, that's me. Um, I guess it's Captain Dillon's um, um, vaccine rollout constrained by international supplies. I mean, how satisfied are you with international uh, rates of production? And do you think things like the, the WTO IP waiver could well, look, I think the pharmaceutical companies that have got vaccines that have, that have been approved, that have gone through all their trials, they're working very hard to ramp up supply as fast as they can. Um, and so full credit to them. They're, they're playing their part in the, the global efforts. Uh, of course, it's a massive undertaking to vaccinate the globe. Uh, and as I've always said, uh, and you'll, you'll always hear us talking about this here too, uh, we want to see high vaccination rates around the whole world, not just here in New Zealand, uh, because actually that's going to add a layer of protection to us here in New Zealand. We're not we're not all going to be safe from COVID-19 until we are all safe from COVID-19. And we'll leave it. What was that? Oh, it could it could help. Uh, <laughs> I think we might be a few more months of, of this to go. Look, uh, COVID-19 throws up new challenges every day. Is there a day, day though, that you'll know for sure that, that the next shipments arriving up towards that, whether there possibly will be delays? 
Oh, look, I'll be on, uh, up overnight watching Flight Tracker uh, to, to make sure that it actually gets here. Thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, I think it's Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning. So. Thanks, everybody.